Okay, so uh, the next few slides are going to describe the extent of commodity dependence. I mentioned earlier that many of the many of the the uh, commodities are actually produced by some of the richest countries in the world. The largest agricultural exporter in the world, for example, is the United States. The second largest exporter, as I mentioned earlier, uh, happens to be the Netherlands, a relatively small country, and so on and so forth. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, and many other countries account for much of the food production which we have in the world. Yet, these countries where the commodity producers are relatively rich, and developing countries, by contrast, are relatively poor. So the whole question which distinguishes developing countries from the rich countries is really the dependence on exports. And this dependence of exports is captured by this, this uh, uh, slide, which shows you the extent of dependency on exports. You will notice that North America, the United States, and the Netherlands are not even colored in these slides, despite their very high dependence on the exports. Next slide, please. Okay, here we are. So what we see here is um, that that so the question of producing commodities and exporting commodities is not the key difference between the developing countries and the rich countries. The difference, however, rise el rests elsewhere, and that is the very heavy dependence of developing countries on commodity prices. This is why the efforts of those who have been struggling to improve and stabilize commodity prices becomes extremely important and the role of the commodity fund in this respect of the common fund in this respect is especially important what we need to think about is how these efforts can contribute to the increase to stabilize and increase the incomes of commodity producers in the world um, Yes, next, next slide, please. Yes. So th these, um, uh, the following slides basically give you an idea of the commodity dependence for different parts of the world, uh, which basically was the point I would be making earlier. Namely, that while agricultural commodities in, in particular, but also other commodities, are produced in all parts of the world, it is really the dependence on commodities which distinguishes the developing world from the rich countries. This is the picture you get for Africa. And uh, you can see here that African countries in particular, while very rich in terms of uh, producing uh, commodities, uh, they remain re relatively poor. And uh, this is, I think, important for us to recognize uh, and, uh, and to reflect upon as we think about efforts to try to improve the lot of commodity producers. Next, please. In Asia, the situation is better, but not all that much better. And uh, again, you have heavy de dependence on commodity exports. In some Asian countries, in many Asian countries, uh, and um, and this of course has changed in the period since uh, Asian and African countries uh, attained independence. But by and large, the colonial patterns of commodity production and exports uh, continue to remain a feature of developing countries uh, um, to this day. Next, please. Now. This uh, table from uh, Angter uh, gives, you, gives you an idea of, of the changes which have taken place over the last decade, uh, from the end of the first decade of, of the 21st century to the end of the second decade of the 21st century. 
some countries have become more commodity uh, dependent or at least are equally commodity dependent, while others have become uh, less, uh, less so. Next, please. Here we see a relationship, the relationship between the average income of the countries which are involved in commodity uh, production and their, de their relative dependency on commodities. Next, please. Now, this is a chart which may be very familiar to many who have been thinking about these issues for a long time. What we have here was a was an uh, observation originally made by uh, uh, an economist named Hans Singer, which was elaborated by the, another economist, uh, Raoul Prebisch. Raoul Prebisch is very significant, not only because he was the first uh, uh, sec uh, executive secretary of, uh, of the Economic and Com the Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, but also the first Secretary General of UNCTAD. And what we see in this is that although prices have moved up and down uh, over the course of the 20th century, what we basically see is a, of an inexorable decline of commodity prices, um, of commodity prices generally compared to the prices of uh, manufactured goods. This has happened uh, and has been extended by other researchers uh, into the late 19th century and uh, more recently uh, taken to the present. Next, please. Now, this is a very interesting thing which many people do not uh, pay much attention to. The late economist uh, Arthur Lewis, um, who is from the Caribbean, uh, and used to teach uh, in, in the United Kingdom for, for quite some time, observed that there has been uh, a bias against the prices of tropical agricultural commodities compared to the agricultural commodities from temperate countries. And uh, the result of this, of course, has been that, uh, again, the tropical countries which have much higher populations, generally speaking, because historically it is in the tropics that you had the greatest fertility of the soil. And uh, as a consequence of that, a higher carrying capacity, you have much more dense populations uh, in the tropical countries. But nonetheless, what we, we find is that uh, the prices of tropical agricultural commodities have declined uh, relative to temperate agricultural commodities. Uh, Bilger Erten, an economist from, uh, a woman economist from Turkey, has extended the work, this work uh, into the early uh, 21st century. Next, please. Now, this pattern is not something terribly new. Uh, this year marks the, the, uh, the completion the 500th anniversary of the completion of the voyage of Ferdinand Magellan. Ferdinand Magellan uh, was, of course, uh, well known as the, as the first, first person to circumnavigate the world, but he did not do so uh, because he wanted to, to see the world. He did so very deliberately because he was looking for some exotic tropical uh, products, namely spices. And uh, in and although we hear a great deal about the spice trade, uh, at that time, um, the, the uh, VOC, the Dutch East Indies Company, uh, basically uh, the, 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 the man in charge of this, uh, basically eliminated most of the, of the population of the Banda Islands in Indonesia today. Uh, 15,000 people were killed. Uh, out of the 16,000 people who, and the remaining people largely uh, ran away. Um, this is something, it's not a matter of, it is a matter of now of public record. Uh, for, for those who are interested, they can go to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and to other places uh, to, to, to see uh, evidence of this. I mentioned earlier that Lewis uh, has shown 
that the prices of tropical commodities have de declined very significantly uh, since uh, since uh, five centuries ago. Uh, just to give you complete the story about Ferdinand Magellan, when the voyage, uh, the, the, the king of Spain, who was not supposed to have access to East Asia, basically sponsored the voyage and um, paid for five ships and over 200 crew. Slaves, of which there were many, were not considered humans and they were not considered part of the crew. But nonetheless, they were very, very important in terms of getting the work done. Uh, eventually, only ship, the smallest of the five ships, made it back to Spain and with only 22 of the original uh, crew. Yet, it was considered a great investment because the King of Spain made a huge profit on the, on the uh, voyage of, uh, of uh, Ferdinand Magellan. So what I think is important for us to emphasize is that this, ob this observation of the declining prices of commodities uh, versus uh, manufacturers, and especially of tropical commodities, is something which has been established from the late 19th century right to the present. Of course, if you look from, from day to day or, or month, year to year, you might see uh, Trump prices going up temporarily, but the long-term trend is quite clear. Next, please. Now, it's important also to recognize that these things are due to very specific human interventions. And what we have seen in recent years is human interventions of different types, which have resulted in sluggish global trade. The sluggishness of global trade basically has had the effect of reducing the prices of, commod of, of commodities, uh, except for a few key commodities, which of course have enjoyed very high prices. Most importantly, for example, the prices of, of commodities which produce energy, uh, are of course, at a, at a very high level uh, currently. Now, what we see now is that after the pandemic, uh, volumes recovered quickly, but and and especially we find that values have risen at least for for the for for oil and other such uh, commodities. But it's also important for us to recognize that there are a number of other commodities uh, which have not uh, seen this kind of raise increase in the price of uh, in prices in the recent period. This is important for us to recognize because now we have two additional factors which have become very important in once again reducing trade. Number one, of course, we have uh, the, uh, the war in Ukraine, which has resulted uh, in a significant reduction of the, uh, of the trade involving, for example, uh, wheat and very importantly, fertilizers. So fertilizers, the trade in fertilizers uh, coming from uh, Russia and, Be and Belarus uh, has significantly uh, been constrained. And this basically means that for many farmers who rely on such fertilizers, uh, they will not be able to produce their, they will not be able to produce as many crops as normally. And this is likely to result in a decline in supply which may have an increase, which may have result in an increase in prices, but was unlikely to compensate for the decline, uh, for the decline in in uh, in in output, and this of course uh, has very important implications for commodity uh, producers. Next, please. Now, I would now like to turn to the second. Uh, area, uh, namely that of food security. I suggested earlier that we do not, uh, we, we, we broaden our focus to nutrition more generally. And I'll come to some of those issues in a moment. But let us fo uh, focus for the time being on a narrow definition of food security. For those of you who may not be so familiar, 
when you talk about food security, the traditional measure of food security is really of the amount of calories which people have, whether they consume enough calories to be able to survive. There is very little attention to all the other macro as well as micronutrients which are needed for human nutrition. So market, and we find that as a consequence of this, um, we, we find that we, we find that markets and governments generally favor cash crops over food crops. This has, this has had a, a, a huge impact. So for example, uh, the, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa used to be a, a, a net food exporter up to the 1980s. And since then, Sub-Saharan Africa is a net food importer for a variety of reasons, which I won't get into right now, but it's important to recognize that there is this systemic bias. Another bias, which is very important to recognize, is that generally speaking, governments tend to favor large agricultural interests, such as plantations, or in Latin America, what are called latifundia, over small uh, producers, such as uh, what, are, what in Latin America are referred to as minifundia. Another important phenomenon is that we find, uh, since the beginning of the 20th century at least, the intense competition among petty producers has been encouraged, which is partly which partly contributes to the decline of agricultural prices, which I noted earlier. Yet another issue to recognize is that food agriculture uh, in many rich countries, uh, it is very clear, for example, in, uh, in the Cape European uh, Union, but also in the case of Japan, or um, uh, uh, the United States, that food agriculture is subsidized. But developing countries who cannot afford to subsidize food agriculture are left helpless because they are discouraged through, by international law from uh, imposing tariffs to provide some degree of protection for their food producers. So as a consequence of this, we find that you have subsidies for the rich countries, but tariffs are the, for poorer countries uh, are not an option. So protecting food production in developing countries is discouraged, um, and, and the converse is true uh, in developed countries. So the so-called market failures, which you often hear about, are actually the results of a framework uh, which is influenced by such uh, policy considerations. Next, please. Okay. Now, what we are going to see in the, this slide and the next slide is that the nature, the demographic uh, distribution of the world's population has changed tremendously uh, over over recent uh, over over uh, over the last uh, century. Uh, where more and more people live in urban areas. So they are no longer involved in agricultural production. And it is the people in the rural areas which, who are in, involved in agricultural production. But if, as they continue to increase uh, in numbers, uh, they often have to, to deal with the limited access to land, uh, which is due to a variety of factors, which I alluded to earlier. Next, please. Next, please. Yes. So you, you see this very high urbanization trends um, which, have, which have been taking place, which are true, especially of developing countries, but less significant in high income countries, which are represented by the red line. Next, please. Okay. Now, one interesting phenomenon which uh, you might be familiar with. Uh, is that according to the World Bank, the World Bank generates numbers uh, where they claim that the number of people who are poor has been declining for the last few decades. Yet, what we see in recent years is that the number of people 
who are undernourished, meaning they are not even getting enough calories to survive, has actually been going up in recent uh, in the in the last half decade or so. Um, and this, of course, should be a matter of great concern. Um, this is true for the for especially true. Uh, of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, but also very true of Southern Asia and also, and, and uh, less true of the rest of the world. Um, next, please. Now, if we look at the number of people who are considered food insecure, they have been rising even earlier. A lot of these differences in numbers are partly due to different definitions. But I want to emphasize that the people who are that food insecure are largely people who do not get enough calories. They may get the calories from rice, they may get the calories from wheat, they may get calories from millet, from sorghum, uh, from maize or what, whatever. But it is calories which are the only measurement, only item which measure, measures food insecurity since the 1960s. But it is very important for us to recognize that this is only part of the problem which we face. Uh, next, please. Now, it's important for us to recognize that most people in the developing world, low as well as middle income countries have not been able, cannot afford nutritious diets. It is also important to acknowledge that even for those people who can afford to have a nutrition, nutritious diet, they rarely get nutritious diet because of cultural factors, advertising and so on, which basically induces them to, to consume foods and food and beverages, which are not necessarily uh, in their own interest. So the challenge is a very big challenge, uh, which is not simply one of affordability. But affordability, of course, is very, very fundamental. And it's important for us to recognize the variety of, of, uh, of needs, uh, which are in, with human needs, which are involved as far as macro uh, nutrients are concerned as well as micronutrients are concerned. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, thank you. Oh, so, sorry. Uh, I think you've gone ahead. Uh, it's a, yeah, go back, please. Yes, thank you. So when we talk about food uh, crisis recently, they have been due to uh, what are called uh, the spikes in food prices. And uh, undoubted, and of course, uh, fuel price spikes also cause problems, but it is food price spikes which are considered uh, problematic. But there's a tendency to focus primarily on prices and market prices. It is important to recognize that a great deal of food does not go through the market. For many people who are barely surviving, they, they, the food which they obtain is either grown themselves or produced themselves, or is obtained in means which do not necessarily, which are not necessarily captured uh, by the market. And this, I think, is important to recognize in order for us to understand why there are still so many people who are not doing well, but who still survive. They survive precisely because they, they, they have sources of food which do, not, which do not necessarily involve the market. So what, we ha what happened in, for example, in 2007 and 2008, as far as the spike in food prices is, I, I, I just want to emphasize two aspects which were responsible for the increase in food prices. Undoubtedly, there were real problems, for example, in terms of rice agriculture. China has become a major source of food, of rice sorry, production in the world. And there was a disastrous uh, uh, harvest uh, in, in China where 
more than 20% of its harvest was lost. It was lost mainly to one particular predator, namely the uh, brown hopper. Now, the brown, without going into too many details, the brown hopper basically uh, is a survivor. So by heavily relying on uh, pesticides, uh, what we find is that farms uh, allow the brown hopper to survive because the pesticides do not eliminate the brown hopper. It eliminates all the other uh, 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 pests, but not the brown hopper. So the brown hopper survived. And so despite the use of pesticides, the brown hopper survived and basically destroyed the Chinese harvest. But when the Chinese went to the International Rice Research Institute, they found that the International Rice Research Institute, which used to have more than 200 people just working on entomology, on, on insects, had basically been decimated and there were only six people left, five of whom were field assistants and only one trained entomologist whom I happen to have met and he has since retired. <laughs> so what we see is a situation where, where even the existing capacity has basically been eliminated because we have left it really to corporate interests to, to deal with these problems rather than, the, than governments taking responsibility for these interests. Uh, a number of initiatives have been tried. Uh, and basically, for example, uh, initiative which was tried uh, in the 1980s, the so-called farmer field schools, which was pioneered in Indonesia, has been a very, very important initiative where farmers learn from one another. Where these kinds of initiatives have taken place and have been successful, we have seen able to survive, able to, 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 to make do uh, in very difficult situations. Of course, now you have the additional problem of extreme weather events due to global warming, where you have, for example, in Southeast Asia, you have El Nino events, which are extended, more severe, and there are long, long seasons of drought sometimes followed by La Nina, where you have extreme uh, heavy rainfall, uh, which, is, which uh, leads to floods. Both are very problematic for farmers, very problematic for food production. Uh, and these are things which are not really reckoned with very much. And very often, uh, it is the poor small farmer who is who's blamed for the consequences uh, of this. The other phenomenon which I think is very important for us to recognize is the advent in the, uh, uh, with greater financialization of, commo financialization of commodity market, uh, markets. What we find is that commodities, yes, including commodity futures, have become part of the, uh, the, the have, have have become uh, an asset class as far as financial investors are concerned. And as, as, a, as an asset class, these are traded very uh, intensively. And many of them because, uh, re result in what is called index trading. So uh, you can go to, to uh, let us say, uh, one company A, uh, which offers, uh, let us say, uh, uh, 12 commodities. and they are weighted in a particular way, or you can go to company B, or you can go to company uh, uh, B, which may offer two different funds where the weightage is different and so on and so forth. And very often the changes in investment are done through, uh, through basically art through artificially, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, where you have Thematic switching from one commodity class to, to another commodity class simply determined by uh, the algorithm with which you have set. So the result of all this is that you can have uh, commodity price spikes, uh, especially in the futures markets, but you can also have commodity price collapses. And this is the, the made this whole situation in 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 the around 2007 and 2008 much worse than it would otherwise be in the more recent situation um, partly because some people lost money earlier what we have seen is that the price of wheat 
uh, went up tremendously because of the speculation of a different type. Uh, as soon as sanctions were in, imposed, um, various speculators uh, moved in and no longer indexed in the same kind of way. But the result, of course, has been was was uh, hugely problematic, especially for countries relying on imported wheat uh, from Russia as well as from Ukraine, where you find that the the, the port of Crimea uh, there was a lot of mining of the ports, so ships could not get through uh, to transport wheat, and it affected West Asia and North Africa especially. And uh, next, please. Okay, what we, we see here, of course, uh, is the changes in food prices over a fairly long period of about uh, six decades. Uh, but you can see that there is, uh, that there is a, a, a trend uh, where, where the, the food prices really uh, continue to remain quite high and largely unaffordable to low-income people. Next, please. Now, another major problem, of course, is that the government investments in agriculture have tended to decline. Uh, this, uh, this graph captures uh, government spending in agriculture uh, by region uh, over the last couple of decades. And this is a, is a, is a very major problem. So you basically have very little government expenditure. Farmers left to fend, largely to fend for themselves. And you also have a situation where farmers really have very little protection in terms of dealing with the large transnational corporations, uh, which are now con increasingly controlling the, the, the agricultural production and, and uh, distribution in very important ways. Uh, both in terms of the production inputs as well as the marketing of uh, of the of the agricultural products themselves. Next, please. So, what we see as a consequence of this is very significant, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a very significant speculation and profiteering. There are many many details. Some of you are more familiar with some. Others may be more familiar with others. I won't get into all that right now, but I think it's important to recognize that the, the that uh, that the there is a significant increase in speculation. So financialization, which in other circumstances was expected to smoothen uh, commodity price uh, uh, um, variations, has actually had the opposite effect to and has actually increased uh, speculation and profiteering of different types. Next, please. Okay, so the results in the, in the uh, wheat price spike just over a four, a four month, four, four or five month period uh, earlier this year is, uh, is captured by this. You can see how extreme the price variations have been <coughs> uh, uh, almost on a daily basis. Next, please. Now, Food prices in developing countries, at least for the consumers, tend to be very sticky downwards, especially when you are importing uh, countries. And of course, what we have seen in the recent period uh, with the um, increase of the, uh, of the uh, interest rates in the US, there has been a movement of capital from many developing countries uh, and even from rich countries uh, to the U.S. Money has gone, moved to the U.S. The U.S. dollar has become much stronger. And as a consequence of that, other currencies, uh, and especially in the developing world, have depreciated. Because many more countries in the developing world are heavily indebted, they are much more vulnerable as a consequence. So you can see some of the consequences uh, in terms of, of, uh, of, of prices uh, for maize, 
as well as for rice. Next, please. For the recent period, you can, uh, well, not, not for the recent period, but uh, you, what, what you can, over the, over the last decade or so, you can see that, that uh, uh, the terms of trade have generally been worse. It's, it, there's a tendency for people like us to, to talk about commodity prices as a whole. But I think there is considerable variation when we're talking about commodities. And especially as far as food compared to other uh, to other com commodities. Next, please. Okay, I think looking taking a longer view and a larger view of things, I think it's very important for us to recognize that the period of trade liberalization uh, is largely over. There was a period. At the end of the 20th century, when there was a lot of interest in trade liberalization, it was sold to many as a period that it would basically lift all boats, uh, that we would basically have uh, lower consumer prices for everybody, uh, thanks to trade liberalization, um, and, and so on. Um, and uh, for those of you who are more economically and analytically inclined, uh, you, it's very important for us to recognize that the methodologies which are used to, to consider whether or not uh, uh, one is better off with uh, trade liberalization are very problematic and contested methodologies. Now, it's important, having said that, uh, it's important also to recognize that there are a number of problems uh, as far as trade liberalization is concerned. Uh, we find that uh, this phenomenon which we refer to as, as, uh, as globalization has resulted in deindustrialization uh, in uh, all kinds of countries, uh, not only in, 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 in the global north, but also uh, in developing countries. If you look, for example, at the numbers uh, as far as Africa is concerned, uh, you will see that the beginnings of industrialization, which were there due up to the 1970s in the first couple of decades, after independence have largely been reversed and have just once again been deindustrialized. Um, and what has also happened is that besides deindustrialization in developing countries, you also find greater food insecurity uh, as much more production is export oriented. The other phenomenon, of course, is that for many, uh, uh, this phenomenon of globalization, and I want to emphasize that we are talking about trade liberalization, because the other, when we use the word globalization, it means all things to all people. It's like the proverbial Indian elephant. <laughs> you know, if you are all blind people touching the Indian elephant, if you touch the ear, you will come to a different conclusion of the nature of the elephant uh, compared to if you touch the trunk or if you touch a, a, a leg. So uh, this is very important because when we talk about globalization, sometimes we are talking about different aspects of globalization. This now, one thing which many people do not realize is that in fact, what is called financial globalization has proceeded much, much more more uh, rapidly than trade liberalization. And as I suggested earlier, trade liberalization has reached its highest point that the, in fact there is now a reversal of trade liberalization as many people in the in the rich countries for example in the united states have realized that they are now having to accept jobs which pay much less because they involve much less industrial skills and so on and so forth their incomes have declined and their life chances have declined they have re this has resulted for example in a great deal of what uh, people like Angus Deaton, the Nobel laureate, and his wife have actually pointed out um, uh, ha has been very problematic in terms of more and more people in the United States uh, re uh, resorting to substance abuse, uh, becoming more depressed, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. All these are, are very important problems, uh, partly due to, to the, to, uh, to, to, partly associated with globalization, but one has to recognize that trade liberalization 
and financial liberalization have different effects and for different people in the world. Next, please. Okay, this is my final slide, and I want to make a point, a more general point here. We, in the recent period, especially since um, uh, a French economist um, uh, published a very important book on inequality about um, almost a decade ago, there has been a uh, uh, Piketty. There has been a great deal of revival of interest in inequality. But you, if you look very carefully, you will find that almost all the talk about inequality is at the national level. Very few people talk about inequality at the international level. And what I want to emphasize in this slide is to, to point out, as Branko Milanovic and others have, have shown, that two-thirds of world inequality is actually international. This is why people want to move. People want to migrate to the rich countries, okay? Because their life chances are significantly better off as far as their, their, their perception is concerned and why they want to move. So this chart, which was done by a man named Bob Sutcliffe, uh, basically shows, you look at the axis on, your, on, on, from, on the left, not the diagonal nearest to you, the rich, are the people on the left, the poorer people on the people on the right. And then if you look at the international dimension, it is the poorer countries front. So you can hardly see anybody who are the poor people in the poorer countries. And it is the richer countries which are at the back. So if you, the, rich plot, the rich people in the rich countries are captured by that skyscraper right at the back there. The, the, the one uh, with, with the grid. So you, I think it's very important for us to recognize that although it is welcome to talk about inequality, most of the time people are only talking about national level inequality and the inequality at the global level is far, far greater. And that two thirds of it are due to differences in among um, countries. And that basically means that for many people, moving is the, is, the, is the option they see as the best option for, for themselves. This is, I think, an important observation, and it's due to the fact that, uh, in a sense, uh, producing commodities uh, in, in uh, developing countries does not offer very much prospects. That's why this whole question of stabilizing and improving commodity prices becomes extremely important while at the same time making food especially much more affordable and ensuring that people have balanced diets um, involving macronutrients and micronutrients. I just want to add something which is not captured by what I've shown so far, is that in many middle-income countries, the biggest problems are not due to people not having enough food to eat, but actually having uh, problems because of two types of problems. One, the lack of sufficient micronutrients, vitamins and minerals is a very, very pervasive problem. And the second problem uh, related to that is the uh, food related, uh, food related, uh, what, do you, what, what do they call that? Uh, food related non-communicable diseases. Okay, these are actually very, very uh, serious. So, for example, there are now many people who are getting type 2 diabetes uh, from consuming foods which are not particularly in their, best, uh, for in, the, in their best interest, but which create a lot of problems for them. So, I think, you know, the, the dealing with the question of commodities is a very, very challenging issue. And, uh, and this is why I, I, I wanted to present uh, this uh, perhaps too nuanced of view <laughs> of, of uh, the, the, the challenges which we face in the world today. But I hope it has been of interest as we try to do some, do more to try to improve the efforts uh, to eradicate poverty and to improve food security uh, for the world. Uh, so, Ambassador, thank you so much for, your, for, for this invitation to 
to speak to you and and and, and through you uh, uh, to to this audience. I, I do hope that this uh, presentation is of benefit to everybody concerned, and this will uh, renew and strengthen our efforts to try to uh, do much much more to improve conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jomo. Uh, I was a uh, very interesting view on uh, how the global uh, commodity system and financial system contribute to multiple causes, why uh, commodities are so often associated with uh, poverty and lack of food security. Also, I uh, wanted to mention that you might want to say hello to your ex-colleague uh, Bubakir Ben Bel Hassan from uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, who I see is also listening on the presentation. <laughs> Uh, people people do follow. Uh, without uh, spending uh, time, uh, because I want to leave some space for questions, uh, could I ask my uh, colleague, uh, Chris uh, Rallis, to give a very brief, uh, just, just an introduction on how the CFT works at the grassroots, uh, looking into food security and uh, uh, alleviating poverty. Uh, Chris, please go ahead. Can I have the slide, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, our purpose is to present to you one of the projects that we are very proud of it here in CFC. The project is based in Senegal, a country with high levels of poverty and insecurity. Next slide, please. So the agricultural sector, which we think is key for uh, poverty reduction and food security in Senegal, is dominated by subsistence farming practices, uh, with farmers having limited access to any kind of inputs or financial services. In the country, the most crucial commodity remains rice, which is a stable food. Now, Senegal cannot produce at the moment enough rice to cover its local consumption. This creates a huge food security issue because the country needs to import these quantities. And that is also increasing the country's dependency on the and very unsustainable international market. Next slide, please. So in this context, it's where our investee, uh, CNT, is uh, working at. It's a rice farming and processing company uh, based in the northern parts of uh, Senegal. The company is the, largest, the third largest rice processing company, and it manages over 7,000 hectares of paddy fields uh, in the northern part of the Senegal. Now for us, uh, CNT was a great opportunity because we strongly believe that Senegal can increase Increase its domestic rice production, and companies like CNT can contribute a lot on that, but they lack the financial resources to do so. Next slide, please. So to make this long story short, uh, we were approached by CNT, and we have dispersed in one point. 5 million loan to them with a goal to increase the processing capacity of the company to about 40,000 tons per year. Next slide, please. So since the beginning, despite delays uh, and considerable problems caused by the COVID pandemic, uh, we have set very uh, ambitious impact targets. You can see them in the slide. Uh, and where are we standing today? Next slide, please. But since numbers are just numbers, uh, I will just point two things. So the biggest and most crucial uh, factor for raising productivity in rice farming is water availability. What you see here is actually a tributary of the Senegal River uh, from where CMT tries to take water and divert it to its own land and the smallholders farmers land that is partnering with it. Next slide, please. Uh, with CFC loan funding, the company has managed to create and construct a small sustainable dam in the region and an irrigation ca uh, uh, canal to deliver the water needed in the area. Next slide, please. Yeah, the company also has bought a relevant and modern uh, harvesting equipment. And next slide. 
which is, and this one is the most important. It has also bought the equipment that it needs to, to remain the canal uh, open and clean in the long term. Now, you were going to ask what's the impact of this project. So if we go on the last slide, please. So the impact, first one, the company has set the rice mill in a village in the nearby area in the northern Senegal. This uh, mill provides quality jobs to uh, locals and also uh, increases the production of rice in the whole region, adding to food security. The next slide, please. And here is what it's all about. In the middle, you can see our good colleague, Hector Besson, the responsible investment manager for putting forward this project. And on the left, we have Seydou. Seydou is a local farmer who decided to stay in his ancestor's land, become an extend a rice farmer. Uh, and because of the irrigation channel you saw earlier, he was able to develop and cultivate 50 hectares of rice paddy in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. And also thank you very much for uh, watching uh, the time. I can see there are some questions already in the chat box. Uh, so just two words. One is that I would sincerely like to congr congratulate, hopefully on everybody's behalf, uh, Hector Bisson, uh, whose uh, birthday is today, who is for this reason on leave and not with us. Otherwise, he would be presenting the project himself. Uh, second, uh, I would like uh, to invite uh, Mr. Clément uh, Chenot uh, from our Fairwood company, uh, that's a nature-based uh, project, uh, to tell us a bit about where we can get the resources because for uh, this and other projects. Uh, is impact investing a source of resources uh, to address poverty in the commodity value chain? Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. Clément. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I will try to be to be brief and give the you a... The I wanted to buy was closed, the shop. And then I had no other option. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Clément, please okay. go ahead. So, 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 there was a... So I, will, I will try to be to be very brief and give a practical view on how I believe what the potential of impact investing uh, regarding uh, poverty challenges. Uh, and for that, I will um, I will uh, briefly explain you uh, what I've been doing over the past uh, fifteen years. Uh, and some of that together with the with the CFC. Uh, so very briefly, uh, my background initially, I'm a forester, but over the past 15 years, I've been working between the finance world, let's say, and the development of sustainable uh, forestry and agricultural projects in, in the South. So let's say uh, working on impact investing uh, projects. Uh, as I told you, uh, initially, I'm a forester, uh, but uh, when I was a student, I was very sensitive about uh, global warming and, uh, and tropical deforestation, which is one of the key drivers of, uh, of climate change. And when you think about how to uh, reduce uh, tropical uh, deforestation, well, the key drivers are um, uh, the demand for food products, but uh, also, and most importantly, poverty. Poverty associated with unsustainable land use, unsustainable agriculture, which is not efficient and which is leading to the, to the clearing uh, of forests. So in fact, I started my, uh, my career in the development world at the French uh, Forestry Commission in their international branch, uh, working more exclusively in, in the tropics and especially in sub-Saharan Africa and, uh, and Latin America and uh, trying to, to think uh, about solutions to, to tackle this, uh, this issue of poverty and associated uh, deforestation. And uh, what we acknowledge at that, uh, at that time, so it was, uh, it was uh, 15 years ago, 
is that there was a lot of cooperation programs that were carried on uh, over decades by the French Development Agency, by the World Bank, the UN, and so on, that solutions uh, were exist, exist, such as agroecology, agroforestry, I won't uh, elaborate, but what was missing uh, was the scaling up and especially the financing uh, to, to scale up and the limits of cooperation uh, budget are their availability uh, to scale up, uh, especially, but also the time frame. As you know, most of cooperation budget lasts for three, four or five years. And there is a real question about sustainability and financial sustainability of, of those projects. And sometimes what we saw and we still see, I believe, are that good program can work. But when you stop this grant and this subvention and you don't have a financial sustainability, unfortunately, some of the activities that work on the ground are not, are not further developed. So that, that was the trigger of our, seeking, our thinking. And we started to discuss with some banks. So that was 15 years ago. And one of them, we discussed with many financial players, but we had a very good meeting and discussion with the Rothschild Bank, which is very, very famous, of course, a well-reputed financial institution. And at that time, they were wondering why, in fact, what they were doing uh, were uh, conventional investments targeting profitability, and I would say profitability only. And on the other side, uh, you know, Rothschild are also famous for philanthropy. So doing programs, grants with no objective of profitability and only looking for environmental and social benefits. And at that time, they started to sing and it was a demand from their clients about financial products that would combine profitability with environmental and, and, and social impact. So that was this meeting was the start of, of Moringa. So, so it was an unusual partnership uh, between the French Forestry Commission and the Rothschild Bank. And uh, well, together, we, we designed one of the first uh, uh, impact uh, fund dedicated to, uh, to agroforestry. Uh, it was tough. Uh, it was very tough to convince investors, uh, but we've been able to raise 80 million euros coming from a blend of development finance institutions and uh, private uh, investors. So regarding the DFI, I should say that the Common Fund for Commodities participated in, in the pool and also is managing the TA facility of the fund. So we've been able to, to raise uh, this fund that was deployed among uh, 10, uh, 10 companies uh, in, in Africa and, and Latin America. And the investment thesis is the following. Uh, so Moringa is bringing equity, so long-term investment to, to entrepreneurs, to small and medium uh, entrepreneurs, agricultural entrepreneurs that develop agroforestry uh, plantation. To have uh, that was uh, something mentioned, uh, the, the, the issue of only producing uh, uh, cash crop. So agroforestry is a way to combine cash crop with, with food crop. So Moringa uh, supported entrepreneurs developing this agroforestry system. The second pillar was a social pillar. So I started my pitch talking about how to tackle poverty. Also, something that was mentioned is, is plantation versus smallholders. So definitely Moringa uh, uh, objective is to support smallholders and not develop industrial plantations. So all of these entrepreneurs support network of hundred or thousand of, of farmers. And then comes the question of profitability. So Moringa is not, is not philanthropy. The objective is to, is to combine environmental and social impact with, with economical profitability. And this is a challenge. We've seen the, the, pre the presentation with this, this, these trends on commodities prices, which is, which is definitely not positive. And what we've been developing with Moringa to, to, to tackle this, this issue is to decommoditize uh, uh, these agroforestry systems and not produce raw, not produce and export raw products, but process them locally and to produce and export manufactured uh, products with less volatility and more uh, margin. And last but not least is the market, uh, and I believe it's key on an impact uh, CVs because you need to be to be profitable. And today, I believe uh, you've got uh, commodities with always lower prices. There, there is all the factors affecting these commodities price, prices were, were well described. 
But there is also a demand for, from, from consumers that want healthy, sustainable product, which is proven, which is transparent, and they're ready to pay premium for that. So I believe this is a, an opportunity to, to make those systems profitable. And that's what we, 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 we targeted with, uh, with, uh, with Moringa. So a few words about uh, examples. So uh, it's a bold uh, investment thesis. They are they were success and failures. So to give a message of hope, I will I will just talk about uh, one uh, one of the key success of uh, of, of Moringa. It's a company named uh, Judelis, uh, based in in Togo in the pineapple sector. So pineapple is a, is a commodity. So, uh, 85% of the world pineapple is produced by, uh, by Costa Rica with a specific variety, which is uh, MD2. Uh, there is few, few places for, for other, but there is a rising demand from, uh, from the market to diversify, but also for more sustainable products. And in Western Africa, you've got, uh, you've got a variety named the Sugarloaf that has a, a very good potential, especially regarding taste. Alors, the fruit itself is less attractive than the MD2, but you can do a very good juices. So we, we had the, the chance to meet with a visionary entrepreneurs hein, based in, in Togo that structured the whole value chain, gathering hundreds of, of farmers, uh, getting the organic and fair trade certification, and thanks to Moringa Financing, they developed a processing factory, hein, which, is, which is today... Uh, a, a big success. Uh, I, I looked at the number, but this year, 6,000 tons of uh, sugar loaf uh, will, uh, will be uh, processed. Uh, the company is profitable. It was a pure greenfield project a few years ago. Uh, 4 million of revenues, EBITDA positive, and a strong, a strong demand from, from, from the market. So I believe it shows that it can work. Uh, I won't say that all cases were as easy. Uh, I told you we had success and failures, but definitely this kind of, of projects show how uh, investment can combine uh, a, a good profitability with environmental and, and social benefits. So last word, and I will say that uh, bon, I started 15 years ago uh, working on this uh, uh, impact investment uh, thesis. At that time, it was a niche, uh, but clearly, uh, right now, it's becoming mainstream. Huh? Well, of course, there is a lot of greenwashing and a lot of announcement, but also there is sincerity from many uh, players that genuinely wants to uh, back differentiate on the market and, and finance projects that are able to combine profitability with environmental and social benefits. I talked about the market, uh, the question of the market, uh, the decommoditization and the, 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 the demand from, from consumers for healthy and sustainable products, I believe is, a, is an opportunity. Another opportunity I see as very strong is, uh, well, uh, as you know, global warming is becoming more and more concrete. And now you've got significant budget from the private sector, from, from banks, but also from big industrials that want to support the agroecology transition, that want to support uh, the, the protection of forests in the south. And I believe this is a, 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 a positive and major opportunity for, for, the, for, the, coming, for the coming decades. So that's all. I, I try to be, uh, to be very efficient and, and short but I will be glad to, to answer any, any question you, you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Clément, and thank you very much for also keeping it short. Uh, the CFC certainly looks into the direction of impact investing, but I don't want to occupy the time because there's already a question in the chat box. Uh, first question is, Professor Jomo, would it be possible to share your presentation on the CFC website? Do we get the sound? Of course. Of course, yes. Thank you very much. I was hoping for that. Uh, and there are already thank yous in the chat box. Uh, so uh, then there is a substantive question that actually links uh, the uh, presentation regarding uh, their financial roles, also the connection with financialization. So I am just going to read it. The notion 
that commodity exchanges are serving only traders and speculators is not new. As a former commodity trader myself, I could list uh, tens of situations where futures were used for the benefit of national procurement agencies to mitigate price risks to the short, as well as to the medium and long term. By ignoring hedging sub subsistence, far by ignoring hedging, subsistence farming loses more than wins. So I wonder if we might want to collect a few more questions before uh, giving space to answer. Uh, there is another comment. I think that more than market price, we need to push and work to raise the agricultural productivity uh, at poorer countries' small holders. Market prices have complicated dynamics and hard to control. Higher productivity will increase the income level and dilute costs. This can be achieved by helping them to use fertilizers in a sustainable way and also invest in equipment as the Senegal project uh, presented. So uh, would there be one more question before we take time to respond? I don't see a request. Uh, if anybody has a question, you can type in the, in the chat box or raise your hand. In the meantime, Professor Joma, would you like to answer those two questions? Thank you very much, uh, Andre. Um, and thank you to those who have asked those questions. Um, I am sorry if I gave the wrong impression that uh, commodity futures is a scam uh, to, 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 you know, I, that was certainly not my intent. All I was trying to argue is that when futures and options markets were first developed, the view was that it allowed uh, producers an opportunity to hedge, uh, the, the, uh, to hedge, and which was basically to to to, to protect their interests. Uh, this, however, uh, uh, did not take account of uh, the, 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 the whole uh, trade in futures, the, the development of futures trading, which has resulted in other perverse consequences. And I was referring specifically to the perverse consequences around 2007, 2008, which I do not think is uh, really very much disputed. Um, and uh, if you if you look at the work of Jörg uh, Mayer Stammer, for example, uh, at uh, at Angted, as well as others, uh, all this is is fairly well established. The question is that whether the question I guess uh, posed is whether or not uh, overall this is necessarily uh, we are all better off. Uh, in fact, I'm I have often argued again in different contexts, of course. Uh, against those who insist uh, that uh, what is what we are seeing right now is simply a repeat of 2007 and 2008. Uh, I think uh, for, for, for someone like the questioner who raises this question, they are familiar that you know uh, history never simply repeats itself. People learn uh, from their participation in the market. And uh, just as there were people who made money, there were also people who lost money. And that's why I emphasize that what we are seeing uh, more recently is a different type of speculation rather than simply uh, a repeat of what we saw uh, in 2007 and 2008. So uh, I, I, I think what all I was arguing for is a much more nuanced view about, uh, you can, about, having, uh, about the consequences uh, which can actually be uh, mixed uh, and actually be uh, perverse. So you can often set up uh, certain, uh, so do, do certain things which are actually uh, with the best of intentions uh, and uh, subsequently have a perverse effect because of some extraneous new development, which is what I was trying to uh, emphasize. Now, the second uh, question uh, has to do with, uh, uh, if I understand it correctly, uh, has to do with uh, with market prices. 
I do not have a simple, I don't think there is a simple explanation uh, to explain all uh, uh, movements in market prices over the last uh, century and century and a half. Uh, I was making, simply making an observation, uh, an empirical observation, uh, and there are many uh, problems with such generalizations uh, because you have, of course, uh, the the uh, the effect of the, the fallacy of composition, uh, which to use uh, uh, the economics jargon in this regard. What, what all I'm saying is that um, you can have uh, uh, mar market price trends which are due to a variety of consequences. Uh, well, sorry, a, a variety of factors uh, with very different consequences. But I don't think anybody can run away from the, that basic observation, uh, which you find from uh, 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 Singer and Prebish and uh, many others who have uh, emulated their work. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Grill and, and Yang uh, from the IMF uh, did this uh, about two or three decades ago. And the more recent work of Bilger Erten, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but in addition to the usual observation about commodities prices uh, versus manufacturers, I was making an additional observation of an observation which was made uh, many, many years ago, uh, decades ago, uh, by the late uh, um, Arthur Lewis, where he pointed out that there has been a trend of uh, Trom trop trop tropical commodity prices, tropical agricultural commodity prices, sorry, uh, having trended uh, uh, adversely uh, compared to temperate agric uh, agricultural commodity prices. Again, we are aggregating a great deal and, uh, and there is no simple explanation for all this. But I think, I think uh, anybody who is concerned about this uh, uh, should uh, should pause and reflect on these uh, trends because these are not trends uh, over over uh, a, a, a day or two or a week or two or a month or two. We are talking about long term trends, and we need to try to understand uh, that prices uh, are due to a variety of factors. So, uh, uh, some of you may may have heard of this English economist uh, named. Uh, uh, Peter Bauer, uh, or eventually he, he, he passed away as Lord Bauer. Uh, Lord Bauer po pointed out, for example, that, the, that there, has, there was, uh, in the case of rubber, okay, which is uh, obviously not a food crop, but in the case of rubber, uh, that the uh, British colonial authorities uh, favoured uh, the plantation interests uh, in uh, places like like my own country, Mal uh, Malaysia, uh, at the expense of the smallholders. There was systematic bias in favor of, of plantations uh, against smallholders, and especially in favor of the larger plantations. Now, some of those biases uh, no longer exist, uh, and some of those biases have been replaced by other biases. For example, there are countries uh, where they are where large uh, 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 agri uh, agricultural corporations are able to access uh, large pieces of land uh, uh, and are able to have considerable influence on agricultural policies in the countries concerned. Uh, if you think, for example, about many of the more controversial uh, um, activities of uh, companies. Uh, such as Cargill, for example. These are all uh, quite well documented by people like Philip Howard and others. Uh, and uh, I think it is important for us uh, to recognize that market prices are simply not the result of many small petty commodity prices, uh, producers uh, competing against one another. We have very different types of market structures uh, for different types of commodities. And even for the same commodity, you can have uh, 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 different, uh, different uh, uh, segmented markets. Uh, uh, for, 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 for example, 
those producers which are which have much more much greater market influence. So I all I'm basically arguing is that uh, we really need a very nuanced view. Uh, it, it you know I'm, I I realize that I'm speaking uh, to the common fund for commodities. And uh, and all I'm pleading for is a nuanced view. But the reason for doing so is relates to the reason we are having this meet this uh, meeting today. Uh, we are basically marking two days. One, the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty, which was the occasion for which I was invited. And uh, uh, and following the, the day after happens to be the uh, World Food Day. And uh, and uh, and I'm very glad, glad my old uh, colleague uh, Bubakar Ben Bel Hassan uh, is in the audience, uh, and he knows uh, how how these two are obviously very very closely connected. Uh, I think we should all think, for example, about uh, how um, you know. For example, if you look at the at the at the data from the World Bank on poverty. Uh, the, the 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 impression given is quite impressive. Poverty is supposed to have gone down all over the world. Yet, when you look at the data, uh, um, you you will find that the data for for food insecurity, uh, you will find that even looking at calorific uh, consumption, uh, you will find that there has been an the de- the decline in food insecurity has been less spectacular than the decline in in uh, poverty. Now, if you ask yourself the further question, how much is food accounts for 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 the poverty? You will find that it is around sixty percent on average. Of course, it varies from country to country and so on. But in 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 sixty percent is 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 more than half. And if you can have such a disparity between the uh, in, the poverty data, which is basically income data, and the food insecurity data, surely that forces us to think very seriously about what what influences the human condition. You know what influences the human condition is is you know and and this this reminds me of one of the great uh, advocates of of trade liberalisation. Uh, 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 Jagdish Bhagwati, arguing many, many uh, decades ago, I think about uh, six decades ago, yeah, he talked about so-called immiserizing growth. And this, I think, is extremely important for us to recognize. Farmers can produce more and more, but the fact that they are producing more and more does not necessarily mean that they are necessarily better off. And these are the, some of the of the difficult questions, I think, those of us who are interested in commodities and its interface with poverty and food insecurity need to think about. Thank you very much for those two excellent questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jomo. And I was I was going to wrap up uh, the questions, but the uh, last question that came before you you mentioned food security actually directly relates. And the question is. Uh, thank you for the comprehensive overview. Food waste and loss account for 40% of our global food staple. How do you see the role of limiting that to increase food security? And after that question, we'll proceed to the wrap up. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Siago. Uh, let me... Uh, I think that um, for my colleagues in in FAO are better placed to answer this question, but they, they they make a distinction between what is called food waste and losses. So basically, what we find uh, they, by definition, food losses are at the point in the process of production. So, for example, if you produce food but the food is lost to pests, uh, say rats or or or, or, or because you are not able to keep the food uh, dry, uh, sorry, the, the, the product dry, uh, 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 then, then, then th- th- that causes problems. So th- it tends to be the case that generally speaking, uh, food losses some, are somewhere between, uh, on, in general, at the grosso modo, at the, at the world level, it's believed to be around uh, 30 uh, to 35%. Now, 
Now, food waste uh, refers to uh, what might loosely be referred to as the whole, uh, all the steps uh, relating to, co to consumption. So you might uh, order a lot of food and throw away a lot of food. That's very obvious. Uh, then you, or you might uh, buy food and then you keep it for too long and then the food is no longer uh, fit for human consumption and you may have to throw it away and so on and so forth. Uh, food waste also uh, happens to, to, to be, again, at the world level, uh, around, around the same percentage. Uh, and so there's a tendency to conflate the two because they happen to be, the percentages uh, happen to be the same. But I think it is very important, and, and I think this is very important. But I want to, to, to emphasize that uh, what we see as uh, uh, there not being, uh, of people being food insecure, not there not being enough food, is usually not because there isn't, they, they, there isn't enough food being produced in the world. That may well be a problem. Those of us who are influenced by, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Club of Rome report uh, limits to growth, uh, of, you know, uh, some would have said that it was uh, too uh, neo-Malthusian and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that there generally is now a consensus uh, that you just cannot simply, uh, you know, uh, that there are such things as limits to growth. So if we accept that this, uh, this, this, there are such limits, we may disagree on some many details, uh, it raises the, 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 the important issue of, of what is possible, what is feasible. And I'm, so what I'm saying has got nothing to do uh, with, I'm not addressing the question of limits to growth. But I think what we have in the world today is a situation where uh, there is enough food uh, which seems to have been produ to, to, to be produced, but there are people who are, do not have enough food. And it's usually a question of, the food being unaffordable or the incomes being low, depending on how, how you want to define the problem. And this is a big problem. So it's not a, so it's not a question as if that, that you know, the, the food is being, I, I'm not saying that food waste and food losses are, are not problems. Those are certainly problems. We, we, do, we want to limit uh, what is lost and what is wasted. But that in and of itself is not, a, a major direct threat to food security. The major direct threat is the problem of inequality, the problem of poverty, and so on and so forth. So I think we have. This is why I think it is so appropriate that the the Common Fund uh, 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 chose chose to organize this event uh, to to think about these uh, these uh, issues and their interconnections. So since this was the last question, let me once again take this opportunity to thank uh, the Common Fund and, and uh, the Managing Director, uh, Ambassador Bilal, for, for this kind invitation to join you today. And uh, I hope, uh, Andre, although I couldn't uh, recognize you from the, from the fleeting picture, uh, that, that uh, th th this was, has been of use to you and to the other colleagues uh, who are participating. Thank you all very much uh, for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Professor Jomo, for making yourself available. And I, it is my pleasure now to uh, pass the microphone to Ambassador Bilal for any uh, concluding remarks. Ambassador Bilal. Thank you, Andre. Uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished governors, alternate governors, executive directors, of the mix, and our Madam Chairperson of the Executive Board, Chairperson of the uh, government Council and more. Um, Ambassador Bilal, uh, could, could, could I, could I uh, ask you to be closer to the microphone? Yes, uh, Ruri, can you uh, move the microphone closer? Thank you. I hope, I hope you can hear me now. Perfect. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we know that uh, we are way past the time, uh, but uh, when you have a speaker like Professor Amo, I think you can afford to shout on many things in life, including your watch. So I take the liberty <laughs> of uh, just uh, thanking our professor and all of you who have been attending us. And I would like you to uh, kind of recall 
uh, for those of the people who attended, I think uh, almost uh, uh, years away, away in 1987, on 17 October 1987, on a chilly wintry morning on a park in near the Paris to demand that we should have an international day for the eradication of the poverty because they came to realize that this poverty is kind of a denial of human rights. And this very park where they congregated on that day, it was the same park where the International Charter for the Human Rights was signed. So this issue of poverty is very much linked to the human dignity and their human self. And this is, I, when we, we came, in fact, I, when I joined this job years back, I came to see that how commodities are so much wrapped around this issue of poverty, but almost that hardly anyone can see it. In some magical way, I think that this prevailing market system pushed this issue of commodities to the oblivion, and we are mostly busy with the market and the state. The community is missing because the community is busy with producing the commodities that help us to put food on our table. And, and however we do in our life, the food on the table, the dress that we wear, and also the gasoline or uh, petrol that moves our, uh, our, our vehicle, is everything is commodities. And we are talking about commodity dependency, which should not be the case because commodity dependency is defined by the answer as something when a country's export basket comprises 60% or more primary commodities. And the world is working for last and for eternity to see that this issue of commodity dependency go down and we can have more and more space. We can say they are not no longer commodity dependent. But as uh, our professor showed, the actual number of commodity dependent country has increased over the years. From 2008 to 9, it was 89. Now it is 101. So what are this thing that we are doing all around? So I just like you to please bear with me for some slides so that I will try to show you that how the poverty is kind of wrapped around the commodity. The world is not looking into it with the kind of attention that it deserves. So let me just go back to this one. Next one, please. Before I go into that, and let me just kind of do a baseline survey that where do we, we stand in terms of our SDG goals. This is number one, our goal. And as you will see, that it is mostly in red. The green part is mostly in the developed world and in South Asia and Southeast Asia. I would like to draw to your attention this Eastern and South Asia that our keynote speaker said that a lot of this green came from their good use of the commodity, which many other countries has not been able to translate. Like you see in the Sub-Saharan Africa, as we have seen, a region which was uh, Food exporting, now they are inputting almost 35 to 40 billion worth of food. And this is despite the fact that in Africa, almost 65% of the arable land remain uncultivated. So, this is, as you can see from this, this is a 2022 chart, that if we go along this track, this by 2030, we'll be way short from meeting this goal. This COVID and this war made it much more complicated. And I, I would like to go you to the next one. And this is where I think I would like to uh, bring to your attention that we are all organizations, but, but still perhaps we are the only one in, in, in this genre who are absolutely dedicated only to issues of commodity. And as you can see that our members have mandated us to in, kind of achieve this mission and implement this vision. And that higher they see the poverty education is one of our central things. Why? Because in life, as we know, that if we continue to remain in a state of poverty, that we are enjoying a kind of life, it is what not a life at all. When you 
Kapoor other peers in many other developed countries. So, essentially, we are now creating a situation where some people are living a life which is almost a kind of a dream for many others, remain unfulfilled. For a Kenyan, it takes almost 20 years to earn the minimum as an average wage, average income of an American, 20 years. And if you look at it from the other side, the same KDM is contributing only 2% in terms of carbon dioxide or using only 100 of the electricity. So this disparity is all around these commodities, but we don't have enough research. We don't have enough kind of literature to kind of make this link and know how we can untangle this from around the commodity. And I, if we go to the next slide and you will see that I'm, we are dealing with a lot of other commodities, but I here I bring you to the example of only this is coffee. And in the case of coffee, you'll see that there are almost 50 plus countries who are producing this coffee, but the coffee trade is actually in the hands of only few in the north. So this is an, an example. This is a research that was conducted by the International Financial Times that showed that in 2019, that for a cup of coffee that you buy in a Starbucks in London for $2.50 pounds. And the max that a farmer can expect to get from this $2.50 pounds is only one pence. So from $2.50 pounds, if I know that only one pence will go to the farmer, I think I'll have difficulty in putting my mouth or have a seat from the cup of coffee. But we are doing it on a daily basis. There is not much kind of an, uh, research or a stories to highlight these disparities. There is another one on the right. You can see that it is on the basis of purchasing power. And there you can see essentially these poor farmers in Africa or Latin America, they are subsidizing the rich consumers in countries like the United States, Italy, or Japan, because they can afford to pay far more than what they are paying now. So we would, the reason that we are trying to highlight to you that this commodity, only one commodity, is not even a, even a cash crop. Okay? Yet, it impacts the life of so many people, but it is absolutely not working for those small holders who are producing it. So next time, Horn, you in a cafe, please try to check what you are sipping into. Next. And one of the reasons uh, that is yes, you'll see this whole coffee thing, the coffee belt. Coffee belt is the most of the coffee producing countries are in between the Tropic, on, uh, tropic of Pensar and, and Capricorn. And these countries, and you can see that 99% of all the coffee is roasted away from the part means that value addition that is happening is not benefiting the farmers who are producing it. By some estimate, in the latest international coffee report, 90% of the coffee is being exported in the green shape. That means 90 90%. So the hard labor that smallholders are placing to produce the coffee is not benefiting them to the extent they should because most of these things are being happened away from this country. But why can't we do the otherwise? Why can't we add value to the, uh, to the producing country? And I know it's a long discussion, but we should begin the discussions. And this is one of the businesses that we can see there to permit that they will try to procure coffee from those countries where they have in this situation to roast. And I think that's a good beginning. Next, please. From CFC, we can not only try to make you convinced that we are not only saying it and for the sake of saying, we are in fact doing it in one of our investments. It's called Markon Coffee. It's one of the big coffee chain. So we only invested in a small portion. They call it lift program. So this is a combination program where farmers are given not only inputs, but also knowledge on how to do things in a way. And it shows that 
farmers who are participating in this leaf program, their income could go from 1,474 to 6,706. That will be a 355% increase. So the reason we are putting it, if you have ideas, if you have something like this, please try to try, try to uh, contact us and let us know so that we can be a part of this internet journey together. I know we are aware of the time, but now I just want to kind of tell you that the poverty, I know that is very sticky, very hard to go around, but we have examples, precedents in the world that they did it in the past, and we can also be hopeful that we can also do it. And who, how they did it, that may be a question remained to be answered, but there is an example that some higher they did it. I will present a, a, a small video, it's only two minutes, from my professor, Professor Graham Ellison, and you will see that uh, he will show you uh, that how in some parts of the world in, in the, have been able to do it. Can you see? So let me begin with a pop quiz. Okay. So uh, 1978, China's just setting out for the market. What percentage of the Chinese population is struggling to survive on less than $2 a day? Look at this pyramid of poverty. You think 25%? 50? 75? Let's see. So 90. So nine out of every 10 Chinese in 1978, I was alive then, some of you weren't, okay, most of the panels were, uh, were struggling to survive in $2 a day. Mm -hmm. So just think about it. I mean, what is $2 a day? I don't think probably anybody in the audience can quite imagine. I certainly can't. I've tried, but uh, actually the World Bank uh, has tried to describe what the effects of this are on human beings. And, if you're severely malnourished, as somebody on less than $2 a day is, as a child, by the time you've gotten to your thousandth day of your life, your uh, brain has shrunk by 40%. So just as a, and now have a good life, okay? I mean, to think of it, it's so bizarre. So 90%. 2018, what does that pyramid look like? What percentage today? Take a guess. Less than two dollars a day in China today. Let's see. 